Hi everyone, welcome back to the HVAC Comp. In the last video, we started off with some of the key building blocks of the DCF valuation or the discounted cash flow valuation. We talked about WAC, the weighted average cost of capital. We talked about discounting and you use the WAC as a discount rate. And to form your WAC, you use the cost of equity and cost of debt and take a weighted average. To find the cost of debt, you simply look at the yield to maturities or you do a ratio of the interest expense over the total debt. Um, of the company to find the cost of debt and to find the cost of equity, we take a look at CAPM or the capital asset pricing model. Refer to the last video for information about getting the WAC and the concept of discounting overall. But now I want to really delve into the discounted cash flow valuation. The last video was really high picture concepts. You're going to see those throughout finance if you continue down this path, um, whether it be you go again in quant finance, discounting, or is very common in all financial instruments, um, and WAC will pop up every now and then. But now I want to really delve into specifically what the discounted cash flow valuation is. And I want to start by quickly talking about valuation methods here. So remember that there are two types of modeling that we can do. We can do relative valuation, which is where we compare the price of an asset to the market price of similar assets. This is comps analysis, right? We use multiples, um, as you described a few videos back, and these multiples provide very little information on their own. They're only useful in comparison. A really good way about looking at comps analysis is maybe if you're looking to buy or sell a home. So maybe if you want to sell your home, you need to figure out how to price it. It's very hard to figure out the intrinsic value of that. So you look at recent home sales in your neighborhood, um, and maybe you have a two bed, two bath home um, that's like 2,200 square feet. And then you see, okay, this house of maybe a block down is like 2,100 square feet and it's two bath, uh, two bed, 2.5 bath, very close. And maybe it's sold for like 500,000. So maybe your house, it's uh, it's pretty similar. So maybe you'll set it maybe 500,000, maybe um, since you don't have that half bath, you maybe set about 450, um, something in that range, right? So that's going to be comps analysis. You're defining your valuation relative to the comp set or a peer set. Now, DCF is a type of fundamental valuation where we want to determine the intrinsic value of a company based on its future cash flows. So the discounted cash flow analysis always starts with projecting a company's financial statements, um, and then we'll use that to actually figure out a value. Now, something that's key here is we need to take historical data and assumptions to project out these future revenues and the future cash flows. So we have to make a lot more assumptions than we have to do in our relative valuation. So the question is, where do we get these assumptions, right? How can I tell you that next year Apple will sell X billion dollars of iPhones and X billion dollars of Macs and X billion dollars of uh, iPads? Um, it's very hard to do that. And I'd like to say that this is both an art and a science, um, and it involves deep industry and company knowledge, right? So you need to know about the industry to understand the secular trends and tailwinds that are driving your industry. So again, if this was Zoom, you didn't need to know much about Zoom at the beginning of this year, but you should have known with the pandemic that it was obviously going to take off in like in that general direction. And then company knowledge to understand how the company prices retains, how much they spent to acquire customers, what is management saying their goals are for this upcoming quarter, upcoming year? What are they saying that what are their um, what is their revenue guidance? How are they saying that they're planning on achieving that understanding if that is possible? So again, it's an art and a science, um, and it really involves trying to understand the business and the industry that you're in. But something that I like to really say, and I think this comic really illustrates it well, um, and I'll give you all a second to read this comic here um, from Dilbert, but essentially he's saying to use the database to, to size the market, but the data is wrong. Um, and if the data is wrong and you like two databases are wrong, it doesn't matter what the transformations that you do on them. The, the data doesn't matter, right? The data is always going to be wrong. So one thing we like to say is garbage in, garbage out. So if you're feeding your model really bad inputs or really bad assumptions, in the end, your price that's going to come out is going to be bad and make no sense, right? So the assumptions are what's really core here. This DCF portion is kind of um, just like the shell, and that's the pretty straightforward part, the fun part here is actually figuring out what is the company going to do in the near term. So a discounted cash flow model here. So let's just go over um, some key parts. Why is it called a discounted cash flow model, right? So we're going to discount. Remember, a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow. So we need to discount our future 
cash flows, right? So the business is worth the future cash flows that it produces as a model, right? So we're going to project several years out, but it's only going to be as good as its underlying assumptions here. So there are four key steps to building a DCF. The first is projecting future revenues. You want to project out future revenues. Second, you're going to convert from revenue to free cash flow. So that's going to require an understanding of costs. You're going to have to account for everything from cost of goods sold to operational expenses. Um, and also capital requirements. So we're going to have to model out pieces of the balance sheet. Then we're going to take these free cash flows. We're going to discount them to adjust for the time value of money, right? And we're going to use the WAC as our discount rate. And then from that discount rate, we're going to calculate a terminal and an enterprise value. And then we can determine an implied price per share. So let's start here um, with the first and second steps, right? Which is projecting future revenues and converting from revenue to free cash flow. So projecting future revenues, right? This is the most important part of the model. Now, the revenue projection model will be a detailed forecast which determines revenue of the company. You want to capture the fundamental drivers of the business in order to capture revenues in quantitative form. You will be making assumptions here, and it's really important to justify, and we'll see that in a few slides down when we um, take a look in some how we do it in Excel. So there are two approaches to um, building a revenue projection model. The first is a top-down approach where you start with the macro picture and think about how the company market, how much uh, market share a company captures. So maybe you'll say that let's start with the total number of widgets sold. Widgets is a very common uh, finance um, example. So we start with the total number of widgets sold, and then we'll forecast the growth of the whole industry. So maybe it grows at five percent a year. Then we determine the current market share of our company and predict how that market share will change over time. So maybe they capture 10% now, next year they capture 15%, etc. So market share then times market size is revenue. So you figure out essentially what is the market going to be this year, next year, two years, three years, four years, five years. Normally we do these projections for five years out. Um, you figure out what the market is going to be in five years and then you figure out for each year how much market share they're going to capture and that's going to be your revenue. Um, so that's one way you can do it. Um, and we normally see this, it's very often with SaaS companies, we see this, and you'll see that in a second why. Um, the other one is bottom up, right? So build a revenue based on metrics and constraints, right? So maybe you say that you're looking at a retail company that's very dependent on retail stores. So like maybe like Costco or Walmart or something like that. Um, or you say the number of retail stores. Um, so maybe they said that next year they're going to add 100 more stores, the year after they're going to add 200 more stores. Then you just look at the average sales per store of maybe stores in the region or where those of all the stores previously, and that just gives you your revenue right there. So that's a bottom-up approach, right? We're looking at the fundamental bottom-up of the company. So top-down forecasting, we look at something called the total addressable market, the TAM. We figure out what the market share is, and then we use that to find company revenue. Whereas bottom-up forecasting, we take a look at products and services. We um, figure out like the volume and price. So this is like, remember, price times quantity here, and then we get the revenue like that. So let's look at an example of a top-down approach, right? So here in this example, we look at our total addressable market. We see that the like 2019 estimated addressable market is total e-commerce is 3,305 um, over there. And then 663, I think that is in advertising, 221 in cloud. So e-commerce are capturing, um, and the market is growing at 19% that year. So, and then they're going to capture 16% of that market share. So we're accounting for these three factors, right? The market size, the growth, and the market share of your company. Um, now, let's go ahead and take a deep dive, though, into the bottom-up approach, because that's the approach that you're most likely going to use for your um, stock pitches. And we're going to deep dive that with Alaska Air Group. Alaska Air is, e, is an American airline that is based in Seattle. Um, but they serve mostly the West Coast, but have had significant expansion over the past few years. This is one of the sample stock pitches you'll see in one of the models that um, we'll be releasing here for that. So the first thing when looking at any airline, right, is we need to predict how much money you bring in from passengers. And again, this is where we use the industry and company-wide metrics to figure that out. So you'll notice what I've done here is we have our mainline passenger growth for 2015, 2016, 2017, our previous 2018, 2019, our estimates. Um, essentially what I'm doing is capacity, um, which is how much are we growing by? So like we grew 6% in 2018, 2% there in 2019. And then the load factor is pretty much how full are the planes. We see how that's going to change year over year. Um, the yield is how many, the average fare per passenger per mile. And then the revenue per available seat mile, we essentially just take the yield multiplied by the capacity. 
um, multiply by the yield and multiply that revenue per available seat mile there to get the the um, passenger revenue over there. So and that's one way we can again look at the industry or the key business metrics here in order to figure out the um, annual revenue here. But you'll notice that we see these little red triangles on the upper right hand corners of several of those cells where I've inputted numbers. So almost anything that has a blue in it, there is an input. It's not a formula. And especially if it has a yellow background, that means it's a key driver. And that's something that we need to pay attention to. You'll notice that I have comments there. So that 6% increase there in capacity was based on current aircraft orders and the routing. They had said that's in their earnings calls. Um, and then you notice I have other comments there. Now, again, for an airline, they have multiple business segments. So that was just the main line segment, but you have to include all these different business segments, right? So if this was Apple, um, I would probably do like iPhones, iPads, Macs, other hardware products, um, and software, they're like cloud services, which should be the App Store, Apple Music, that type of stuff would be the four main business segments. Normally, if you look at the 10K document, they'll detail the business segments of the company, and it's probably best to pull that information from there. So these are literally straight from the business segments from the Alaska Airlines 10K. So now that we figure out our total revenue, right, we do the same process for mainline, regional, freight, and mail. Um, we just do a straight year over year change there. So we figure out like the total revenue of the company. Now what do we do? So we need to figure out free cash flow. Now remember that free cash flow measured is the cash generated after supporting operations and maintaining capital assets. So we have free cash flow is equal to EBIT plus depreciation and amortization minus taxes, minus the net change in capital expenditures, minus the net, the change in net working capital. And this is going to give us our unlevered free cash flow. So now that we have the revenue right, we need to get to EBIT. So let's take a look here. Let's model the rest of the income statement now to get to EBIT, right? So we're going to start with our total revenues. Um, here we see that it's 7,000, 8,000, 9,000, 9,000. Next, we'll project out expenses to get to EBIT. Um, and remember that these assumptions should fit in line with their investment thesis. So it's common to think of on the margin, but be careful about the potential fixed and variable costs. So wages and benefits, right, for Alaska Airlines, um, percent of total revenue. Again, this is relatively fixed cost there. This is not... Um, I'm sorry, it's a relatively variable cost, right? So it's going to scale with the capacity there. So that total revenue, as the revenue increases, we're expecting those costs to also increase because they have to require more aircraft. Um, so that's why we just maintain that percent of total revenue there to project it out. So essentially all I do is 25% of total revenue normally goes to wages and benefits. Next is aircraft fuel. Again, more passengers, um, we might want to increase the percentage of cost of aircraft fuel. And sometimes in my appendix, well, often you'll see appendices with other figures. I actually tr change these numbers around to create a margin of safety, which is something we talked about in our first lecture, right? Margin of safety. Even if you're off by a little bit, how wrong can you be and still make sure you get a positive return? Aircraft services, we maintain those fairly constant. When I was doing this in 2018, they had noted that aircraft services was cheaper, uh, was lower this year than expected. So that's why it's a little lower previously. SGNA, there's no reason for us to believe that SGNA would have increased. Uh, and then like other operating expenses, there is no change there. So that gives us our operating income, right? Now, remember to get to EBIT, we need to get earnings before interest and taxes. So we need to um, do the interest and taxes. Um, so non-operating income slash interest, we see it's actually negative here. Um, it's a negative percent of total revenue. That's just the way they report it um, there. And then the total income tax expense. We'll notice, right, so we just say that we're going to increase that um, when in actuality, right, technically that should have decreased due to the Tax Cut and Jobs Act in 2018, 2017. So, so essentially, these are the key line items. Again, you really want to go and look at the company's financial statements from the 10Ks and 10Qs to just figure out what costs and expenses you need to account for here. This is very specific to this one company. We provided a template, but you'll notice that you'll probably have to add cells um, and stuff to your template and add rows to your template. So now that we find net income, we add back the interest and taxes to get EBIT. Um, so we have that. So now we have EBIT, right? So now depending on the business, the depreciation and amortization can be constant. Sometimes it's best to keep it flat. Taxes, you probably already found the amount of tax to calculate the net income and add it 
added it back to EBIT. Now you want to subtract it out. I know it's a little confusing, but that's okay. Net change in CapEx, you probably want to look at what management has said for future capital expenditures. That's going to be um, the best way there. So again, if it's an airline and you know that they have 30 planes on order, you can kind of figure out how much the 30 planes are going to cost based on the type of the plane, when they're expected to take delivery, and when they should charge those out. Um, and the last one we're going to talk about here is the change in networking capital. This is a little confusing. So let's uh, refresh what networking capital is. It is the amount of money a company has available to pay its short-term expenses. Positive working capital is when current assets are greater than current liabilities, and negative working capital is when current liabilities are greater than current assets. And remember, quick brain test here, what is current assets and current liabilities, right? It means occurring within the next 12 months, so either coming due in the next 12 months or getting paid in the next 12 months, right? So to find the change in current assets, um, the change in current assets, we want to project out the total current assets, the total current liabilities. We want to find the non-cash networking capital and find the change by comparing it with the previous period. So let's look at an example here. So you'll notice for current assets, I model it out. Percent of revenue, DSO, day sales, outstanding is a very common mechanism for modeling out accounts receivable. And if you just Google it, you can find the formula for it. I don't remember it off the top of my head. Inventories, percent of revenue over there, and then other current assets is a percent of revenue. So you'll notice almost everything here is that accounts receivable and accounts payable is a percent of revenue. So we're modeling out these are balance sheet assets and liabilities here. And we'll notice that we take the total current assets and total current liabilities. Um, the next thing we'll do is we'll take the net working capital non-cash there, and then we'll figure out the changes in um, networking capital over there. So, so yeah, so that's pretty much how you figure this out here. This is kind of harder to explain in a PowerPoint. You definitely want to take a look at the model that we have released. I'm going to put this all up on the Google Classroom with this video, and that will um, help you to see the formulas here. Remember, we're going to be providing a template here. So the best thing to do is to just, again, fill in the template um, with your company information. That's probably going to be the easiest. That's our recommendation, especially for changes in networking capital. You'll notice that some models actually like try to really um, just like hand wave this a little bit, but we want you to get the full experience of going through and figuring out the change in networking capital there. So now that we have our free cash flow, right? We figured out EBIT, we figured out our DNA, we figured out our taxes, we figured out what our capital expenditures are, and we figured out the change in networking capital. We can put it all together here, right? So we start with our operating income slash EBIT. This is what we got in our previous first section in our when we did our income statement. Then we're gonna effectively subtract the tax that we added back to find our EBIT. We're gonna add depreciation and amortization. In my case, for an airline, it was relatively constant. We kept it pretty constant there. Um, changes in capital expenditures. Again, management had indicated how much they were intending to spend. It was actually in an investor presentation, literally these exact numbers. So that's exactly where my numbers came from. And changes in networking capital came from the previous slides, uh, from the previous graph. Um, table that we just saw on the last slide, where you found the changes in networking capital. Again, you add them according to the formula, so just be careful with your signs. So we start positive EBIT, you add back the, um, or we subtract out taxes, so it's minus tax, you add depreciation and amortization, you subtract CapEx. And remember, it's a negative change in networking capital. So if networking capital is positive, you subtract. If there's a positive change in networking capital, it's a subtraction. If it's a negative change in networking capital, it is an addition. So just be careful of that. The signs for that can get very confusing and hopefully with us providing a template that will not be as confusing. So this brings us now to unlevered free cash flow. In our next video, we're gonna talk about how you go from the unlevered free cash flow, how you discount it using your WAC, and then how do you turn this free cash flow numbers, these discounted free cash flow numbers, into a projection of the share price. So where this is the hard part is now behind us. Now the rest of the stuff is pretty straightforward. It's almost like filling out a form, it doesn't change. This is where you need to be creative and understanding what is the best way to model out your operating income, what is the best way to model out your revenue, the best way to model out your expenses. Um, and going to office hours and checking in with your section leaders and working as a group here is gonna be super important. So in the next video, we'll put it all together. See you then.